Hello and welcome everyone to our P Inc. USA webinar. It's 1 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and get us started so we can stay on time. Uh, welcome today. Uh, this is the second of our webinar series that we've just begun, uh, and it's going to be from our Recreational Navigation Commission, um, or RECCOM. And the topic today is going to be an overview of the fundamentals of marina planning and design from small recreational boats to super yachts. Um, and it'll be covering, and those are working group pu publications 134 and 149. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Mark Pirello who is our U.S. representative for RETCOM. Um, and before I do, actually, I just want to remind everyone that um, PNQ USA is the U.S. section for the uh, World Association for Waterborne Transport Infrastructure, which is an international organization, and uh, we're the U.S. section of that. Uh, it's a membership-based organization, uh, but you can also download these reports and purchase them individually if you don't wish to become a member as well. And we'll walk you through that at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to turn things over to Mark. Um, again, he's our RECCOM, Recreational Navigation Commission, U.S. representative, um, and get things started. Mark. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, good afternoon or good morning to wherever you may be. Uh, we want to thank the participants today for joining this uh, first RECCOM webinar. I hope uh, one of many more to go in the coming uh, quarters and years. Um, just as a kind of a follow through to what Rachel was uh, discussing, one of the primary initiatives for RECCOM is to promote excellence in sustainable planning, design, construction, operation, and management of marinas and recreational navigation infrastructure. And as we discussed earlier, this presentation is really an overview of those of two working group publications, uh, 134 and 149, uh, related to planning, design, and operation of small and large marina facilities, including super yachts. Uh, today's presenters uh, come from a diverse background in marina planning and design field, and they include coastal engineers, uh, marine structural engineers, and marina operations and management. Um, our first presenter today will be Margaret Boshek of the Smith Group. Um, Margaret's a coastal engineer with a pl marina planning and design experience that really transcends both ocean environments, lake environments, and riverine conditions. Um, following Margaret will be Tim Mason with Applied Technology and Management. Uh, he's a senior waterfront engineer that has uh, planned and designed marinas and super yacht facilities in the U.S., Caribbean, and the Middle East. Um, and then we'll change it up a little bit. We have uh, Nicole Pauly of Moffa Nickel, uh, who will share her perspective on the planning and design of dock and utility infrastructure for a range of marina facilities, including really recent developments in the design of super yacht facilities. And then our last presenter is Megan Lagasse. Uh, she is the Marine Director at Pier 66 Hotel and Marina in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And her background really showcases and reinforces uh, what I think is considered the importance of integrating marina operational considerations really at the onset of marina planning and design process uh, right from the get-go. So uh, this webinar really, as Rachel said, is kind of an overview. So we're going to really only highlight specific uh, planning and design considerations for, uh, for both the two working group publications. So in working group 149, we're really going to be you know, part two and part four, and then there's about four or five sections of working group 134 that will highlight. Uh, we do encourage the participants to download the working group publications uh, to delve into really all facets of the planning and design process. So without further delay, let me turn and, this presentation over to Margaret. And actually, Mark, let me just interrupt for one moment uh, for logistic sure. purposes. I just want to remind everyone we are recording this webinar. It will be available on our YouTube channel. I'll provide a link in the chat. Um, and we do have lines muted right now, but we'll give instructions on how to uh, ask questions at the Q&A portion at the end. And you can uh, type a question into the chat at any time, um, but we will get to them all at the end. Um, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to, I think, Margaret, you said. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel, and, and, and thank you, Mark. 
So um, as Mark mentioned, I will be talking about the Working Group 149 Guidelines of Marine Design. More specifically, I'll be focusing on Part 2, and even drilling down further than that, I'll be looking at just a few chapters within um, uh, Part 5, I'm sorry, Chapter 5, uh, which deal with the design criteria, the entrances to small craft harbors, agitation within the harbor, tranquility, and harbor resonance. So, Looking at planning considerations on where to, to sit a marina, there are um, a couple topics that we would like to, to focus on. And the first being environmental conditions. What are the, the winds and waves at the location? Now, both of those can be determined through historical records or even going out and placing um, uh, instrumentation to, to collect that data so that it can be analyzed later on. Um, the same can be said for, for water levels and depth. Does depth change due to sedimentation and uh, variable water, whether that be tides or, or as in lakes with flooding and precipitation and runoff, which we'll get into a little bit. Currents is a big one. If, uh, if you're on a riverine environment, if there's very strong currents, that's not the best place to um, put a, a marina, um, as it will cause overloading onto the moorings themselves. Ice, a big concern where I am in the Midwest, um, and how thick that ice becomes. Not only is it going to be uh, damaging to the marina infrastructure that you have, but also could cause um, damage to, to any boats or, or any floating items that left in the water over uh, the winter period. Now, if you're in a seismic zone, this should also be considered um, as part of your, as part of your, your considerations um, as it will uh, affect oh, the basin uh, itself. So focusing in more on location, uh, we look at protection. Is there any natural protection where you are, or do you have to create it through the use of breakwaters, either floating or fixed? The geotechnical conditions, um, if there is a limitation on how much you can dredge an area, that might not be the best location, uh, particularly if there's large um, water level variation. Material availability will help focus in then on the cost. If there are local materials that can be used in the construction of a marina, um, that, that's something to, to take into consideration. On rivers and streams, again, you want to look at currents, and that focuses in then even more on sedimentation and whether your basins will naturally fill uh, because of the currents within those rivers and streams. And also, um, if those rivers and streams are, are easily flooded and expand their, their reaches, how is that going to affect your basin? Uh, not only the marina and the location of the boats is important, but what type of availability do you have in the upland and access to that location? If it's hard to reach, it's not going to do very well. Um, adjacent uses, I've seen marinas placed in the middle of manufacturing districts. This is not the best location, um, unless there are future plans uh, to, to remove those, of course. Um, and amenities that might be nearby that you can you can reach out and jointly use um, with uh, the neighboring communities and such. Utilities is also a big one because getting utilities to a new site can be costly and, and could play into that planning consideration as well. So additional studies that you would want to do when, when looking at where to place a marina, if it is a brand new marina, is an economic market analysis. And that's determining the needs and, and really the return on revenue for, for the additions that you're making or, or the investment that you're making. This can be done to an existing location as well if they're looking to swap out, say, their dockage and really uh, focus in on a new market that might be burgeoning in the area. Regulatory is going to play into that. Um, um, regulatory is different state by state and, and uh, country by country, so it's really knowing um, the regulations in your location and, and how that's going to affect the planning of a marina. Um, don't underestimate reaching out to citizens and special interest groups because they do have a lot of ideas and concerns that are going to play into um, the setting of a new marina. Uh, and that will, um, that will, will focus the, the, uh, the design of your marina in a different way. Um, and also, don't underestimate cost, because obviously that is a big uh, driver for whether something is going to, to even get off the ground. So keeping an eye on those costs from the very beginning all the way through the planning is in incredibly important. Uh, future trends cannot be underestimated uh, or uh, under uh, stressed 
Um, the the vessel sizes, uh, I'm sure we we can. Uh, someone else will talk about this, but the sizes of vessels are getting bigger. Um, they're also getting wider, and how that's going to play into the dockage layout. Uh, and you want to to look at dockage then that is flexible. Um, future amenities, what people want in in a uh, marina. Marinas are no longer just for boaters, but they are for the community at large. So, what amenities can you offer? Uh, for the non-boating uh, population that might be using your marina. And uh, let's not forget about economic fluctuations. We had a downturn about 10 years ago, and, and a lot of recreational boating um, decreased. So how do you keep a marina open and operational during those economic downturns? And really that gets down to um, adaptability of your your company, or I'm sorry, of the operations of a marina, and how we as uh, developers and designers can help our clients get through that. So going a little faster, um, again, don't forget cost. <laughs> uh, looking at acceptable risk. Everything that we do comes with a risk. Everything we design comes with a risk. Um, and it's, it's ridiculous to think that something is going to last forever. So when we start talking about return period events and storm events and seismic events, um, we, we should really understand what that means. So we, to, to look at risk, we use this Poisson distribution, which is an encounter probability, and that's based on a period of time um, and a return period event. So uh, one of the most important takeaways from this is that a lot of times we say, this is going to last for 100 years. I should design for a 100-year event. Well, what this distribution actually tells us that the likelihood of a 100-year return period event happening within 100 years is actually 63%. It is not a one chance. Um, and also, think of it as a roll of dice. If you roll a one the first time, if you roll it again, you could roll a one the next time. So a 100-year event doesn't happen once in 100 years. It just means there's a 63% chance of it happening in 100 years or a 1% chance of it happening on any given year. Well, 63% chance risk uh, of something happening is a lot. Um, and a lot of times our marine infrastructure is designed uh, or, or uh, is given a warranty for a much lower amount of time, say 25 years. And if it's 25 years, then there's a 22% chance of a 100-year storm event could happen within that time. Now, if I'm an owner, one in five chance of damage or destruction of my facility is a lot, and I would not be accepting of that. I might be more risk at first. So say I only want to accept a 5% chance of something happening during that time period. Well, me as a designer would have to look at almost a 500-year event to limit my owner's uh, or my client's risk down to 5%. So we want to design for events that are much larger than the amount of time that we hope something will actually be in service. So going back to environmental design criteria, just to give an overview of these in, in a bit more specific way, waves uh, we can collect from historical records. There are a number of buoys located throughout the U.S. that are, are physically uh, collecting data. And the Army Corps of Engineers and NOAA also then do uh, numerical models um, that they share with us for points uh, all along our shoreline that we can extract data from, that we can then analyze. Um, separately, if, if waves are not available, we can get that from winds. Um, almost every airport in the United States collects wind, so, so sh we should be able to find uh, wind data from a location somewhat near our, our location for setting our marina and determine uh, the waves from the winds um, just by using uh, simple um, growth, uh, um, I'm sorry, wind-generated growth uh, uh, out of the CEM or, or some other um, publication. And let's not forget that boat wake is also incredibly important on rivers. We have a lot of uh, large cargo ships and such passing. These send out boat wakes that could be the design drivers for your facility um, because not only are they um, – uh, more frequent and larger, uh, but they are also monochromatic and therefore uh, carry a lot more energy in them than a uh, wind-generated wave, which is more of a spectral irregular wave. Uh, currents, they can be either driven by tides moving in and out of a facility, or they can be wind-driven. Um, this uh, would happen along the, the shorelines. 
Uh, we also have stream discharges and river flows. Sometimes I see streams actually discharging into marinas themselves. Um, this is a bad idea because if there's a very large torrential rain pour, we have a good amount of flow coming down this river and it's actually blown out um, marina infrastructure inside that, that basin. So this is something to consider. Water levels is a real big one and uh, on the forefront of everyone's mind because of um, climate change and sea level rise. But you can generally get a, a sense of water level changes in your area, whether that be river, lake, or on the, our coastlines from historical records. There are a number of um, tidal, um, tidal recording instruments that are placed along our coastlines um, that are uh, freely available online that you can download records from. In coastal regions, again, those are, are really driven by your, your tides and where you are along the coastline. Now, sea level rise and vertical land movement is different in each location or how it's being uh, affected in your location. And we also see that sea level rise is on an upward trajectory. Um, so planning over the, the lifetime of your facility to make sure that the water levels that you've designed for can be accommodated even 100 years down the road. Um, because many of these, these facilities will still be in operation uh, long after we stop working. In inland lakes and rivers, uh, we have a balance between precipitation and evaporation. And if you're anywhere near the Great Lakes like I am, uh, sometimes that does go out of balance and you get extremely high um, precipitation for a number of years as we actually recently have had. And this results in widespread flooding and higher water levels than um, what has been historically recorded. So understanding how that plays into your facility and making sure that it's still operational or easily um, more resilient and therefore more easily opened up after such an event uh, is important. On top of, of your static lake levels, or I'm sorry, even of your um, static ocean levels, you have waves set up and surge, which is going to lift that water level temporarily, uh, but maybe for a number of hours um, on top of your, your normal water level variation. So you have to add that into um, your, your vertical water level elevation change uh, as part of your design because it can cause a good amount of damage to your upland, even if it is a temporary um, increase in water level. And then sedimentation and dredging, um, uh, a good amount of sedimentation happens in our harbors when the water levels are higher, um, or we have that, that variation of pull, pushing sediment into our facility uh, during high water and trying to scour it out at uh, lower water. Um, if sedimentation happens, how often are you going to have to dredge your, your facility uh, is a, also um, a consideration. So for the onshore, um, sorry, offshore approach corridors coming in, now this is when you're coming to your entrance, you want to plan out a certain width to accommodate vessel traffic. Now, if you have single vessel traffic around three times the width, which is the B variable in that, um, the width of your largest vessel that you anticipate should be sufficient. Um, that is on, on the small side, and this is for um, good conditions of no waves, no currents, no other outside influences, uh, three times that width. Now, if you have two-way traffic, which is the norm for most um, facilities, then in ideal conditions where you don't have a lot of um, uh, outside influences, five times the width of your largest vessel, and make sure that that navigable depth and not just at the high water level is, um, is sufficient. Now, as uh, other outside influences start to play in, such as currents and the waves, um, then that would, could increase uh, up to about nine times the navigable water depth. And these are just rules of thumb that um, the minimum size that you would want to even consider is, uh, is about 100 feet or 30 meters, and you would want to grow from there. Now, as I mentioned, outside influences can play into the size of of the um, entrance channel. So these are some just additional uh, adjustments that are given within the publication that you can easily apply to these minimums uh, so that you can come up with a more realistic approach corridor. Now, while we would want to avoid making any um, turns within the entrance channel as this is a very 
um, dangerous location for, for vessels to try to, to make sudden turns or adjustments. Um, if a, a, a turn cannot be avoided, then we want to look at a large radius with a minimum of about two times the length of the ship for your radius. Uh, more and more we see this in the four to five times um, the, the length of the ship range. Now, if, if the larger ship does have assistance uh, or bow thrusters or reverse screws, then this can be reduced, um, but we would want to limit that down to about 120% um, of the length of the ship and no less than that. Now, we do recognize, though, that when a ship is turning and is at the apex of a turn, such as it's shown on the upper um, uh, graphic there in that image on the right, we want to increase that width because the, um, the bow, I'm sorry, the stern of the ship actually starts to go outside the line uh, or the direction of movement. So you would want to allow for more room there to allow that turn to, to occur. And now sometimes you can avoid it and you need to turn around within the basin itself. Um, again, if it, there's assistance, you can get that down to about 130% of the ship, and they can almost turn on a dime. Um, but the preferred for, for non-assisted um, vessels is to increase that uh, turning circle um, uh, radius to about two times the length of the ship. So en entrance orientations. Um, having an open uh, uh, marina entrance and allowing that ship to come right in is your ideal, but when you do that, it also allows all of those external factors, such as the wind and the waves and whatever else, to also come into your basin. So a lot of times uh, we try to offset our, our entrance um, to, to block as much of this energy as possible. Uh, we, we want to allow vessels to come in um, without those external forces acting on them because it is an area of highest risk. And to do that, we want to avoid direct seas following, so pushing the vessel into the marina with waves directly behind. If we have beam seas that's hitting the vessel directly on the side, that's pushing it in one direction or another. And for the, the vessel captain, that's, that's a hard to accommodate for. Um, for sailboats, having a direct wind attack actually pushes them backward and they would have to tack back and forth against that. Uh, so we would want to avoid that for, for heavily um, populated marinas that have sailboats. So to that end, and once you look at all those factors, um, the recommendation is to have a rear quartering sea, which is actually coming at the ship from, from a quarter off its uh, stern. And this helps um, push the vessel, yes, into the, the marina, but they don't have to adjust so much for coming in um, into the marina itself. Now, channel depth uh, is is important. We talked about sedimentation within the, the entrance channel and how that's where um, a lot of sediment that's either running along the shoreline will like to drop out because it's a bit calmer there. Uh, so then we see that starting to fill in. So when we talk about minimum depth, we want to look at the lowest water, of course, and we want to allow for two to three feet of, of uh, depth um, below the deepest draft vessel and plus some percentage. So now if we're looking at sheltered waters, it's pretty darn calm then we only need about 10% of that additional draft. And do recognize that power boats um, are a lot uh, shallower draft than sailboats. So if the intent is for sailboats to be able to access the marina or for the future, um, if the trend is moving toward a, a more uh, sailboat friendly um, uh, market, then we would want to account for that, that deeper keel uh, so that they can enter into into the basin. For for a moderate area, so if waves are about um, uh, less than one meter, and again, you got to think of this as this is a time when vessels would be coming in and out and still actively enjoying um, uh, the the lake or the ocean in a recreational capacity um, because this, this isn't really for commercial um, uh, marinas, but if you do have a commercial marina, then you have to account that they are going to go out no matter what type of uh, wave environment is happening on on the water. Um, and in which case, you would want to increase that that incremental percentage to about 30% of the draft. Now, if it's even higher waves than that, uh, again, this probably would be commercial um, locations. Then you want to increase that to 50% draft. 
And that's because you have a lot of bouncing up and down and uh, the, the response operator of your vessel um, bobbing up and down is even bigger than the wave itself that's coming in, at, in and out. So you want to account for that. Uh, if there is a rocky hard channel bottom versus a nice soft sandy bottom that would just allow um, a keel or a bottom of a boat to sink in, then you want to increase the, the depth even more because we don't want damage to the bottom of any of those vessels. Um, dredging and sedimentation is a big uh, consideration and how often you want a dredging program to, to continue. Now, there, there is a recommendation within the, the PNC um, of about four to five meters, but this is uh, very site variable, um, and in which case you would want to look at, at the conditions at your site and adjust um, to what is appropriate there. Based on the agitation, we want to limit the agitation within the marina as much as possible because any type of agitation on those boats is pulling on the moorings and causing undue strain not only on the boat, but on the dockage infrastructure as well. Um, so we see a good amount of waves entering into a basin, and what we want that to do is to die off as quickly as possible. Um, the, the effectiveness of a reduction of waves entering into a basin is a function of its wavelength. And so this means that if you have longer periods um, which is the, the um, basis of, of a wavelength, um, then that can penetrate more fully into an entrance, I'm um, sorry, into the marina basin. So um, such as the, the, the graphic there on the bottom, this shows that even a gap width of about two wavelengths, if you are five wavelengths inside the marina, you've only reduced the wave by about 50%, and that's at 0 0.5 there. So you have to think of this as to how far can you put, um, safely put uh, marina dockage and infrastructure inside that entrance. Now when you're, you're um, putting in wave protection, if you, you want to overlap your protection more than uh, one wavelength, and this, this um, uh, allows for more dissipation of energy that is passing into the marina basin. Now the picture on the right um, while I'm showing it as an example, it's actually a very bad example because there, the overlap of the, uh, uh, of the protection is very short, and you can see that the angle um, that the waves are coming in are actually just bouncing right into uh, the marina basin, and you can see a good amount of agitation leaching into the marina basin and causing issues um, to that dockage. The, the only way to uh, reduce this is to extend your marina protection in that case or create wave absorbers um, so that the, the energy dies out more quickly. So agitation, there are some tranquility goals that are, are published within the, the, um, the PNC guidance, and that looks at um, different wave events and what agitation is acceptable within um, the harbor during that time. So the graphic on the right is actually based on the wave period between two to six seconds. And you can kind of see the range between um, head seas, which allows for um, higher waves because boats are made to ride over the waves, versus beam seas, which is a much lower um, agitation threshold. And that's because the, the vessel starts to rock side to side and cause undue strain again. Um, and now there is what, what is shown within the table is for a moderate uh, environment, or I should say a good environment, and then there is, you can multiply that by either 75% um, to get an excellent or a 1.25 to get a moderate. Um, so in that graphic on the right, you can see that your, your waves, your acceptable wave climate for a 50-year event could be anywhere between 2.5 feet all the way down to about 0.5 feet and still be within that acceptable agitation range. Now, Piang did take this one step further and started looking at vessel sizes because um, larger vessels can accommodate more, uh, uh, more agitation than smaller vessels. And what we have then is um, a requirement of uh, agitation by size and also by direction. Now, one thing you will notice is this middle range um, of wave period of about 
two seconds to six seconds actually results in the, um, the smallest threshold of acceptable agitation. And this is because a lot of vessels in that range actually hit their resonance frequency um, in either uh, yaw or, or surge or sway and therefore start moving um, in excess of the agitation. And therefore the, the agitation um, thresholds are lower for, for such vessels in that range. And we know that a lot of our wind generated waves are going to result in wave periods in that range. So this is something to be mindful of when looking at um, your agitation requirements and how much protection of your, your basin that you actually need. So another frequent problem that we'll see is resonance within a basin. Um, and uh, fortunately, we've become much smarter than we were in the 60s and 70s when this was a bigger problem because we've identified um, what is the, the source of resonance and have accounted for it. So an identification, an easy identification when you go to a ba basin to, to recognize that resonance is a cause um, of, of problems within the basin is that you'll see standing waves or you'll see this bathtub effect of the water lifting and lowering um, within uh, a longer time scale. Uh, or, or you'll just see excessive agitation within the basin, even though the conditions outside the basin are generally very calm. Now, the sources for, for resonance could be uh, directly linked to the geometry, where um, a length of the basin is a multiple of a dominant wavelength. And this results in then you get the standing wave um, syndrome that, that is represented in the image on the right. Uh, this happens mostly because you have reflective surfaces, um, either at the entrance or inside the basin that are allowing the wave energy to, to bounce without much dissipation or absorption at all. And then you get an amplification then of the energy as it's uh, bouncing around the marina. Now, when you have a narrowed entrance and a wider um, basin, uh, this can cause uh, resonance. There are, there are um, guidance within the publication that, that tell you uh, what size entrance versus the basin that you should avoid. Um, if you have a shoaled basin, that means the basin is a bit more shallow than a deep water outside. You'll get a lot more water getting pushed into the basin, and therefore you'll, you'll get that amplification. And that's, that's an indicator of that bathtub effect. You'll see that. Um, and also a slender basin. If it's long and narrow, but you have a, a wider entrance and more um, energy can get in, or I should say more water can get in, then you have that, that resonance start to happen back and forth as well. So uh, although it's not within um, uh, part two, it's worth uh, talking about, as it will be in part three of the, the um, publication, is dockage layout. Um, now, every country uh, has uh, a different uh, guidance on this. Uh, I shouldn't say every country, but there are multiple um, different guidances that, that um, can be found uh, across the globe for layout of dockage. Um, now, the, here in America, we tend to lean back on um, the Army Corps of Engineers Manual 50, or uh, that, that lends uh, or um, takes heavily from the, the Tobiasen publication. And those show that the, the fairway length should be somewhere between 1.5 uh, to 1.75, the backing distance of your longest vessel within that, um, within that fairway system. But you can see that uh, for sheltered sites from the British publication, you can actually narrow that down even to um, only 33% larger than, than your largest boat. But they also um, have one of the, the highest requirements on the other side saying that if there are substantial tidal flows or you have a lot of sailboats which don't have very good maneuverability, then you want to increase your fairway distance even more to 2.5, the longest vessel. They also give guidance um, across the, the different um, um, guidelines through all the, the countries, uh, fairway, I'm sorry, slip width, whether it's a single slip or a double slip. And you can see that there's um, adjustments in this table at the bottom as to how much clear width you want on either side of your boat. Um, now, as we, I mentioned very briefly at the beginning of this, vessels are getting wider and they're getting longer, and that's generally the trend. 
So accounting for that in the design now by adding an additional space for that to grow into um, is is a good recommendation for for future planning um, and future proofing your your marina layout. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, trade this over to Tim, who's going to tell you more about uh, marina infrastructure. Tim, you might be muted. Yeah, Tim, just make sure you hit star. Am I on now? Oh, yeah, you're good. There I am. Sorry. Got it. Sorry about that. Um, this is Tim, um, and I'm going to provide an overview of the same working group 149, part four, which is marina infrastructure. And we're going to focus here today, because we have limited time, um, on design criteria and loads, birthing systems, and utilities. So here we're talking about uh, design criteria and loads. Uh, we'll start with vertical loads on the docking system. So these are the loads that would be applied for structural design, whether you're employing a fixed or a floating dock system. Um, and anybody who's a structural engineer will understand all these terms. Um, we have dead loads, which are the weight of the dock and all permanent attachments uh, that we always have to consider. That may also include biological <clears throat> excuse me, growth or fouling that can happen over time. Um, and then we have live loads, which are temporary um, loads that would be due to pedestrians, vehicles, um, et cetera. It could also be due to things like uh, that photo in the lower right. You've got some wildlife issues with some sea lions um, taking up uh, space on your docks, um, maybe snow during a winter event if you're in a cold climate, et cetera. And we have a couple of different types of live loads. We look at uniform and concentrated. So that table on the lower left is from the report um, and just summarizes kind of the range of uh, uniform loads in the center column and concentrated or point loads that would typically be applied um, for different situations, whether you have restricted access or you have unlimited or public access. Um, and I guess the only comment I'll add to this is that these values I find to be reasonably conservative, um, and regional and national guidance may vary from this. So some of the some cases the values may be lower. I think some of the California boating requirements are for the uh, uniform load is as low as 25 pounds per square foot versus the 52, for example, here that's shown for restricted access. So there are some variations, and, and like anything else with marina design, it takes some uh, judgment, uh, engineering judgment, and uh, coordination with um, the project team. Um, the application of this for a fixed dock structure um, is is to structural design to drive the the framing elements and things as well as the foundation. For floating docks, um, the graphic that's kind of in the lower center um, shows how we apply it um, for floating docks where we're talking about the freeboard, which is the distance um, from the water level to the top of the deck. And we would look at when we apply a certain under dead load, we want the dock to float with a specific minimum freeboard. Um, and we'll talk about that in the, on another slide. But then when we apply these various loads, it will affect the stability or the buoyancy and the freeboard of the docks. So for example, under uniform live loads on the dock system that's floating, we would typically look for a minimum value under the uh, full um, uniform live load to be not less than, say, 0.25 to 0.3 meters minimum, so about uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 inches is typical. Now, when we move into horizontal loads, there's a lot more variety of them, um, and we have two main categories. We have environmental loads, and then we have vessel loads. And um, the, so the environmental loads um, could be uh, to the dock system themselves or in the vessel load uh, case with mooring loads, it's the load being applied to the vessel, which then is being uh, directly applied to the dock system, either via pushing or pulling on it through uh, mooring housers or fender systems. So I'm not going to go through these in detail. I know Margaret talked a little bit about some of the different types of loads. Um, and it depends regionally and geographically, and then you may have very – everything is always site-specific. Um, so, of course, you have to evaluate them based on your site conditions. But critical ones that are always need to be considered are um, wind, 
and and also waves can be critical. And sometimes people tend to overlook that, especially if they don't have a coastal engineering background. Um, and if you meet the harbor tranquility criteria that Margaret presented um, on the lower end, you may be able to get away with kind of, let's just say, ignoring waves or not considering them to be critical. But in other more exposed conditions, that may not be the case, and those could drive the design. Um, one other factor I wanted to point out on wind um, when you're looking at designing of marine systems, um, when we're looking at a fixed structural, like a fixed pier, something like that, it, the, the wind load that you use, the wind speed, is a gust speed, which would be similar to what you're used to um, in most of the um, national and international guidance. So you might look at a three-second gust for your wind speed. Um, when we're looking at floating docks or vessels, we will typically look at a longer averaging period, so a sustained wind speed. In the guidance here, it's uh, shown as 30-second wind speed, and that can vary with vessel size. We also are allowed to take certain shielding um, uh, approximations, and we have to account for the profile height of the vessel. So in the photos, you can see the difference between in the upper one having a super yacht next to probably what's about a 30 to 35 foot little sport fishing boat and you can see the significant difference in the profile height of them um, and then the small vessel if the if the wind is blowing across the beam of a large vessel from the opposite side that small vessel is going to feel very little if any wind speed so we we do have shielding factors that we can account for and then one other load that we look at horizontally is the impact force which is usually looked at independently of the others but it can be a consideration in designing your docking system. So, and then, and then to wrap that up, we have load combinations. And in the PANC guidelines, it, it pretty much refers to national guidance um, from various sources. So, as one example, we would always try and look at, say, an, a fully occupied facility where you're going to be adding up the wind force on the vessels pushing on the docks. You've got wind, you may have currents, and you have waves at some design water level and occurrence event. So uh, at a minimum, we'd look at that. But you may also look at an unoccupied condition as a survivability or design event at a much more uh, higher return period event. Uh, going just a little more into detail on waves, because I said that they do um, sometimes get overlooked. I mean, you never want to have a breaking wave uh, like you see on the upper right um, at your marina site where the docks are, because in a floating dock situation, there aren't many, if any, that may be able to withstand that condition. So what we have to really look at, we have the lateral load on berth vessels and docks, um, which you can see in the lower photo. You can see waves hitting that dock sort of on its beam or um, parallel. The wave crest is parallel to the long axis of the dock. So you have your lateral load that would be either on the vessel or on the dock. We also, with floating docks, have to consider vertical bending in the in the docks. So if in that lower picture, if the wave was actually coming from the right of the page and running with the wave crest perpendicular to the long axis of the dock, it would result in what's called a hogging and sagging motion that would induce bending inside the dock uh, structural elements and connections. That can be critical in places where you have waves that exceed uh, you know, 0.3 meters or one foot type level. And then with fixed piers, we have to worry about uplift loads uh, on the decks, depending on the wave conditions and water levels. And I think the takeaway is, you know, on the tranquility guidelines that uh, Margaret presented, as long as we remain within kind of the, the lower end or the middle range of those, then the wave forces can be usually pretty minimal and they're not so significant where the wind force may be more, more uh, significant on the berth vessels and, and facilities. But once you go outside those levels, then you really have to take a look at it or provide perimeter protection to protect your facility. Okay, this is not covered in the document, but we thought it was important to throw in here, um, and it's regarding procurement of floating dock systems. So the industry practice in this is to procure them as sort of a design-build element um, because we have – many different suppliers of different types of dock systems, which we'll get to in a minute, um, that are prefabricated. And it's similar sort of to roof trusses if you do building design, where, you know, an engineer or designer um, working on a project is not going to come in and design every nut and bolt in the system. It's proprietary. Um, you can go out and put out performance criteria. And then what we would do is have the 
dock supplier or contractor provide signed and sealed uh, stamped you know, shop drawings and calculations to demonstrate to you that they meet the requirements um, outlined in the performance specs. So in the performance specs, what we would typically address are things like the materials that are acceptable, the various loads and the combinations to be considered, and then we have various design criteria and tolerances for freeboard and stability, uh, the connection system, and other things like a warranty and, and making sure that that's in place so that you know you're getting uh, some minimum requirements that are, that are needed. Now, going into uh, discussing the various birthing systems, uh, these are kind of the selection considerations that are general, whether you're talking about fixed or floating dock systems. Uh, we have water level changes in depth, exposure, which we've already sort of discussed um, so far, um, freeboard, and, and the freeboard of the dock system, this goes back to Margaret's comment about um, knowing your market and your users. So you really need to know that going into the project, um, especially if it's a new project. If it's a renovation, the marina management may know exactly what's needed and what's required, and you, you have your design conditions. So you know you're dealing with small vessels, you're dealing with super yachts or somewhere in between. But you really need to know that, and then that's how you can set a lot of these parameters um, and freeboard is one of them to make sure you're accommodating your target vessel. You also have aesthetic preferences, um, availability of materials and suppliers, and then, as Margaret had mentioned, cost is obviously always an issue. Here we're looking at the various uh, typical considerations for floating dock systems. So. Um, the photos on the right show several of the different typical commercial systems. There are others beyond these, and there are a lot of different local dock suppliers that make different products. But as far as floating docks, these are the sort of the main type of systems that we see. Uh, these, the different um, yellow callouts for the different types, is referring primarily to the structural frame of the dock system, whether it's a, 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 a sorry marine grade aluminum uh, treated timber or steel. Um, each has its applicability and limitations, and then you have concrete systems, which would be a, the flotation and the dock structural element may be all concrete, um, or it may be uh, something that's connected with a, a timber or some other kind of whaler system um, to transfer the forces between the float modules. For the framed systems, we have flotation that may be in the upper left, uh, that photo, it's an aluminum frame system with a timber deck, but it has a concrete uh, flotation unit um, for the buoyancy. Um, other systems may have a polyethylene um, encased tub, and typically these flotation systems are encasing uh, EPS styrofoam. And there are some systems that may just have air inside, and they could be metal tubs or some other kind of system. So there are a variety out there, and again, going back to it, this is why we'll use the performance specifications as the procurement method. Um, for floating docks, we're not really limited by depth because the docks move up and down with the water level changes. Um, the exposure should be somewhat limited uh, because they, they will be limited to the amount of wave action that they can take. We're typically employing birthing, uh, sorry, floating systems uh, for water level changes greater than three feet. It doesn't mean you can't do it if you have a smaller tide range or water level change, but this is where they're usually required. Um, and your freeboard, again, this is for your typical vessels, not super yachts. You're going to be looking at something that's up to about uh, two feet or 0.6 meters. Most commercial systems for average size boats, we're looking at somewhere between uh, 18 inches and 24 inches is typical, and that's that's the dead load condition. So, and then you have these various aesthetic preferences and available suppliers. So, a lot of considerations there. When we go to fixed docks, uh, we're more constrained in the depths because we have to be anchored with piling, um, and so we're limited to more or less 20 feet or less, six meters. That doesn't mean you can't go in deeper water with fixed docks. It just becomes more expensive. Um, you can, though, accept a higher level of exposure um, and larger waves. Um, and it's typically employed for uh, tide ranges less than three feet. Um, it's also a lot of times for larger boats like super yachts, fixed docks may be preferred um, just because of the, the sheer amount of force that's going to be on the docks and the mooring points, the bollards and cleats and things. 
We can do a, a larger freeboard with fixed systems, so it's not really limited, whereas in floating docks it is based on the buoyancy available. And then we have a variety of materials. Um, the traditional materials are uh, timber and concrete, um, and that would be the, the frame and deck systems and the piling. But there are also examples with um, aluminum or steel components. You might have prefabricated deck elements that are aluminum. Um, and then in recent years, more use of plastics and composites. Um, that photo on the lower left is a FRP uh, system, which is at a Coast Guard dock actually near me here in Jacksonville, Florida. And they've got um, FRP type uh, pipe piles filled with concrete, and then the entire dock system, uh, horizontal members and the decking are these FRP units uh, with stainless steel connections. So um, it may be not, it may not be able to handle the same loads that say a, a heavy reinforced concrete dock would, but um, it does have some advantages. So there are options out there. Now, how do we uh, hold these things in place, specifically talking here about um, floating docks or pontoons? So we have several options. On the left, we have piles and pile guides, which is sort of what I'd consider the preferred um, method when you have tidal areas, um, again, typically less than or up to about 20 foot depth, um, and when you have soils that you can drive into with the piles, basically if you have suitable soils. And if you have areas where you have very deep water or you might have large water level changes that, that happen over a longer period of time, like on a reservoir or a lake or in some river situations, um, we would use or employ a flexible system. The upper picture is a winch and cable type system, which would be to a concrete dead man or some other anchor on the bottom. Those are, the, in this case, they're manually adjusted with the water levels. Um, on the lower, uh, the lower frame there in the center is what I consider a uh, kind of a standard uh, flexible system that's used worldwide. Um, it's either chain or elastic roads to dead weight or some other kind of embedment anchors. And there's, there's advantages and disadvantages of, of, of any of these systems. And again, it's all somewhat site specific. On the right side, we have stiff arms and slides, which are a little more unique. They may be applied in places where you have uh, a site where your dock has to be constrained pretty close to the bank and you don't extend too far out into the water, or you have very deep water or, say, a rocky bottom where there isn't a potential to drive any kind of piles or something on the bottom. You can attach to the shoreline um, with a stiff arm that articulates as the dock goes up and down. Um, and then the slide at the bottom is just if you're in a case where you're very close to, say, a key wall or a bulkhead and you just don't have much space and you need some way to attach the dock, um, that is one way to do it. So there's a lot of different options available. Now I'm just going to review um, some of the traditional vessel mooring methods. Um, and what we have here are uh, finger piers on the left side of the screen. And these are sort of the preferred um, method, I, I would say, at least in the, in the states. We have um, it, it, sort of balance of convenience and efficiency, um, where and it, and it allows folks to have a dock on one or both sides of the vessel for access and for um, for mooring and berthing. So you see there we have single berths and double berths. Those are somewhat um, geographically driven. Um, I know single berths are in the states are more popular on the west coast. And then other areas and internationally, you see a lot more of the double berth. And the double berths tend to have reduced cost because you're eliminating one of the finger piers. Um, and it may save you a little bit of space and be a little more efficient. We also have the, uh, the lower right photo or image of the double berth with piles where you can install uh, mooring or fender piles for additional um, strength and mooring points. Um, and then we have the lower center is side tie berth which is alongside berthing, that's the most flexible option where the, the vessel lays alongside the dock, but and, and so it can accommodate various sizes of vessels uh, on any one dock length. It could be somewhat less efficient because um, you take up more room than the actual length of the boat requires to allow for maneuverability when you're, you, know, you have adjacent neighbors basically on the boat. And then on the right side, we have med mooring, uh, which is named after being initiated uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, there you have the vessels, which in this case, it's a floating pontoon. 
the vessel, there are no finger piers, but your berth perpendicular um, and generally stern toward the dock. And how that works is you're, you're tying off to anchor points, uh, sorry, tying off to bollards or cleats on the dock. And then you have, you're either deploying your own anchor lines off the bow into the channel, or in some cases you may have a fixed uh, system of chain and anchors in the center line of the fairway with lines that run back to the dock that you can pick up and attach. So the advantage of this is you can maximize the number of boats and space you have. Uh, it's a lower cost because you have a lot less um, fixed dock structure, if you want to call it that, from the peer perspective. Um, but it does tend to be less user-friendly. So unless you're used to doing it, some boaters don't prefer this method. You have no way to get on and off your boat other than from the stern. Okay, now we're shifting gears a little bit into uh, marina utilities. And um, I think in the, in the uh, super yacht discussion coming up, they're going to talk some more about utilities, so I won't go into a lot of detail here. Um, the three top elements that um, are shown in bold are what I would consider the uh, primary uh, utilities that need to be provided in the marina for the various berths, um, electrical or shore power to provide to the boat when they're at the dock, um, fresh water, potable water, and lighting. Um, when you go beyond that into things like sewer, wastewater, communications, solid waste, and fuel, um, a full-service marina, you would want to have all of these. But there may be some cases where you don't need to provide those because you may have a neighboring facility that provides fuel service. And uh, environmentally, it's better if you don't have that or maybe you just don't need it um, from a practical or space perspective. So you have these different options um, of what to provide. And, it, it, again, it goes back to the market and, and kind of economics of how this will all work out. Um, on the photo on the lower left is a power center or power pedestal, and that is where the majority of the, or at least the primary utilities are provided for each vessel at the berth. So you have a stanchion or pedestal that provides your electrical, your water, and your lighting typically in one package um, to suit uh, the, the boating user. Um, and then there are some other considerations with the utilities, especially for your fresh water and your other plumbing. Um, you may have a situation, uh, if you're geographically, where you can freeze. So you have to consider that and how you can either provide water through the winter if you have patrons or to be able to winterize so you don't have uh, damage to your facility and your piping over the winter. This slide goes into a little more detail about uh, marina electrical, um, and I think a big thing in this is there's a challenge. Um, it's trying to balance the available utilities on your site, the available electrical service, um, with the needs of the boaters. Um, so the, the guidance provides the table on the right, which gives you typical receptacle requirements at the power center. So these are the, basically the needs of each of the vessels for the various vessel sizes that are shown on the left side of the table. And what we do is we split that out. So in this table, it's called out as U.S. for sailboats and motor yachts. That's because the U.S. operates on a 60 hertz frequency system. In other places of the world, Europe and other places, um, you may have a 50 hertz electrical system. And the voltages that are available to you and the various configurations of these receptacles that provide the power, shore power to the vessels, they vary. So that's why I say that geographically, depending on where you are and what's available at your site, you will have to um, accommodate and balance what's available versus what the boater really needs in the design of the electrical system. And I think a, uh, you know, a takeaway of this is um, from a planning perspective, um, an engineer like myself, who's a coastal engineer, I can, I know a good bit about electrical and I can, I can plan it, but I'm not going to go in and do the detailed design. So if you can convey to an experienced electrical engineer um, what is required at the slips, then they can take the design from there to the details that are needed to meet all of the various codes. So the, there's local codes and standards in the U.S. here. We're primarily referring to NEC and NFPA, which have a specific um, segments uh, designated for marinas. 
So that's what we refer to. And then other countries and areas have different codes that apply. Um, and they have various things in there that allow for diversity and demand factors, which is basically saying that when you have any one electrical circuit, um, not all the boats that may be connected to that are going to be using power at the same time. So there are ways to reduce the power demand, if you want to call it that, for um, occupied conditions, and the codes allow you to do that. And th that is addressed um, inside the, uh, the publication. Um, there are also requirements for minimizing the, the loss of voltage or voltage drop because that can do damage to the, the systems on the boat. And then we also have safety measures like grounding and ground fault protection, which um, in order to reduce electric shock injuries um, in recent times has become a, a significant part of the electrical uh, codes. This slide just shows some common issues with marina utilities. Um, this, uh, the lower left and the lower center are really two that I think are probably most important here, where it's space, and space is critical, and usually there's not enough of it. So when you're designing a marina facility, uh, what you don't want to do is wait to the last minute to have your utilities designed because any fixed dock on the left, it's a fixed pier, uh, the pile cap, and you can see there's a sort of a rectangular um, opening or uh, trough that passes across the pile cap. And then you have um, circular sleeves and boreholes that run through the cap and all the utilities pass through. In the center, you have a floating dock that has even less space available. So having the design of the utilities completed or at least a long way along before you finalize your plans for your docking system is very important and that coordination has to happen. Otherwise, you could get into a situation where your utilities just physically don't fit with inside your dock or your piers. And uh, that could be very costly and expensive. And in some cases, you might need to even run the power lines and utilities underwater and come into the dock. And that's what's shown in the lower right photo where um, this was a site in Charleston, South Carolina, where we had to run the uh, super yacht utilities from shore um, all the way out on the on the river bottom, and then up the pile uh, that stanchion that's towards the on the right side behind the bikes, and and bring that down into the transformer and the panels on the dock to service the big boats. And then we have emergency equipment. Um, this is addressed in the publication uh, for, with spacing and uh, placement requirements for things like safety ladders and life rings and buoys, um, spill containment, environmental protection. Um, and then a key one that I kind of lump in with, uh, with utilities is firefighting equipment. And again, here, this is really um, geographically dependent and you really have to look at the local and national codes for guidance. It's very important to meet with the local fire authorities or authorities having jurisdiction um, early on in your project process to make sure that you are providing the level of fire uh, firefighting uh, equipment that is required by them. Because they, I know here in the States there's times where you might have somebody who will accept something slightly less than the code because of local uh, restrictions, maybe not enough water supply, et cetera. Or you may have somebody who actually goes above and beyond um, what is required in the local code. Here it would be NFPA. And then this is my last slide. These are just some related publications um, to Part 4. If anyone wants additional reference, um, other PNC publications that cover some of the topics in more detail that uh, I overviewed in my section. And what I'll do then is turn it over now to Nicole and Megan, who will discuss uh, Working Group 134 and Super Yacht Facility Design. All right, thanks, Tim. So uh, Working Group Publication 134 is the Design and Operational Guidelines for Super Yacht Facilities. This document is intended to supplement the small craft marina guidelines. It's not meant to be a standalone guideline. Data was collected for the guideline prior to 2012, so I will try to provide a few updates as I go along. I'd like to clarify some terminology before we start. The terms mega yacht and super yacht are used interchangeably in the industry depending on location. This guideline uses the term super yacht to mean any vessel greater than 24 meters long, professionally crewed with a captain. 
The guideline is broken down into 10 chapters, with chapters 4 through 9 being the meat of the document. I'll be focusing on chapters 4 through 7, which discuss the vessel characteristics and facility design. And then I'll pass it off to Megan to cover the utilities and operational considerations. In 2011, a study determined that there were 5,750 super yachts in the world, with the largest being Eclipse at 163 meters long. This number continues to raise at an average rate of 160 new super yachts per year. The world's largest yacht is now Azam, which is 180 meters long, but 180 meter research super yacht Rev Ocean will surpass this when it is completed next year. Looking at the distribution of super yachts, approximately 80% are motor yachts and 20% are sailing yachts. Since motor yachts make up the majority, this presentation will focus primarily on them. The super yacht fleet is very young. More than half the super yachts in the world are less than 20 years old. The graph to the right represents the evolution of the top 100 largest super yachts from 1997 to 2012. For purpose of this presentation, I have added the current top 100 largest in yellow for comparison. As you can see, the trends continue to shift in the direction of larger vessels. And as of 2000, or 2020, 40% of the top 100 motor yachts from 2012 no longer make the list, and less than 10% from 1999 are still on the list. Similar to small craft, Vessel dimensions such as draft and beam are commonly published data. Graphs provided in the guidelines show correlations between draft and beam relative to length. Another important dimension for super yachts is air draft, uh, but there's limited information available for these custom super yachts. The guidelines plot what available draft data there is relative to length. Air draft is an important consideration when selecting marina location as super yacht air drafts can exceed 30 meters, eliminating many locations with low bridge clearances. Super yachts access the dock via passer rails from the stern and medmore configuration shown on the left and from gangways on the port and starboard sides of the vessel in side tie or in slips with finger piers as shown on the right. When evaluating the location of a new super yacht facility, you'll need wide entrance channels and deep water access. Super yachts are often located near harbor entrances to minimize dredging in the harbor. You'll also need to consider vertical clearance where fixed bridges will limit the air draft. Super yachts need large spaces to turn around, so the guidelines recommend a turning basin diameter of 1.3 times the length of the vessel when super yachts have propulsion systems are in generally favorable conditions. When selecting dock orientation, consider environmental conditions such as prevailing winds and currents. These conditions can be amplified by the large sail area and deeper drafts for these super yachts. The vessel configurations discussed by Tim are similar for super yachts, so I won't spend much time on them. Uh, you know, side tie, finger pier, and medmore are, con are typical with uh, Side tie and medmore being the most common. Side tie is the most flexible for accommodating a wide variety of vessel sizes, and medmore generally allows for the most efficient layout, as you can see on the bottom right figure where the vessels are very close. Super yacht destinations are generally seasonal. It's very important to establish the targeted design vessels but it's also good to plan for flexibility in the dock and especially in the utility design to accommodate smaller vessels in the off-season. Locate the mooring hardware to maximize usage of the dock. Don't skimp on the mooring hardware, as the same berth for a larger vessel can be used to support multiple smaller vessels in the off-season if it's designed with this in mind, resulting in revenue-generating facility year-round. A unique consideration for super yachts is that the crew stays on board the super yacht. Design of dock and utilities and upland amenities should consider the crew's needs, and Megan will elaborate on this a little bit more later. And one tip is to not forget about the tenders. Super yachts like to have easy access to their tenders, so provide space around the vessel to accommodate them whenever possible. And you can also utilize dead space in the marina to stash tenders, like shown in the lower image below. 
The slip width tables in the guideline calculate, calculate minimum slip width as vessel beam plus the fendering on each side of the vessel. The first image is a good example of a Medmore facility utilizing these minimum slip widths. Consider additional space for access to port and starboard garages, as shown on the left, or mooring of tenders alongside the vessel, as shown on the right. Many superior facilities also offer repair services. If your facility is one of these, consider additional working space around the vessel for workflows and scaffolding. When determining the length of the slip, approximately 20% of the vessel can extend beyond the end of the pier. Minimum recommended length beyond the end of the pier is 0.8 times length of the vessel. Reducing the slip length to allow the bow to overhang the pier can both save on structural costs because it's less square feet, and it can improve maneuverability in and out of the slip in tight conditions. Floating docks are generally preferred in the industry, specifically for large tidal ranges and deeper water depths. Fixed docks may sometimes be preferred where the dock is exposed to larger waves and stronger currents. For the floating docks, super yacht, or for super yacht floating docks are robust, high freeboard floating docks. The guidelines recommend freeboards of 0.8 to 1 meter, depending on the vessel size. Deck height should be higher for fixed docks uh, than for small craft piers to accommodate higher boarding heights. Guidelines indicate the average deck height for a super yacht fixed dock is 1 to 1.8 above mean high water. When laying out your facility, provide sufficient dock widths for the intended operations. The guidelines recommend a minimum of five meters for main walkways and three meters for finger piers. The design loading for super yacht facilities typically includes golf carts and sometimes service vehicles, such as forklifts, delivery vans. So provide clear paths for design vehicles without obstacles in the way, with the ability for golf carts and other vehicles to pass each other and turn around and align deck elements to minimize disruption to this path. You can add additional floats adjacent to the finger piers to move equipment out of the path as shown in the middle photo. Here. These images all are good examples of facilities with sufficient dock widths. And here are a few examples of things that are often overlooked. In the first photos, the gangways and deck elements are impacting the path. These can make your facility seem like an obstacle course. To the right, for vessels berthing bow in, consider how bow overhang impacts your dock. To the bottom left, don't place the pedestals too close to the deck. They can be impacted by the vessel. And if they're too close to the edge, the crew can, has to carry heavy lines around the pedestals when they're trying to tie up the vessel. And the last thing is the plan for frequent pedestrian traffic, whether it be for marina staff, repair services, deliveries, or just crew getting on off the boat. The dock can get very crowded. And now I'm gonna pass this off to Megan to talk about marina utilities and operational considerations. You may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Sorry, guys. I was talking away. Um, but thank you, Nicole. Um, so here you'll see on, we're going to get into marina utilities for super yacht. Tim slightly touched upon all of that. So for these marina utilities, we're going to talk about power, adequate for super yachts, high-speed fuel or access to that, um, sewage pump-out, potable water, fire water, 
high-speed Wi-Fi, security cameras, deck levels, and underwater, underwater lighting. You'll see the items in bold are items that we'll really focus on because they're slightly different for super yacht marinas. So first up with the super yacht shore power, one thing that we're going to keep referring to is home port versus destination marinas. Destination marinas have boats running at 100%. So they're the boats that have the owners on the boat, the crew, the hot tubs running, the laundry running. Most vessels will not plug into power because they're just, they live in fear that the power will not hold and they'll constantly jumping from generator to power. And then home port requires a strong connection that holds the boats and really gives the, not only the boat time to breathe, but also the, lets the crew take a little break and know the power can hold the vessel. The chart on the right, as Tim had said before, kind of shows the guidelines, but now we're really starting to find that boats are requiring more power because things like iPads are running the entire boat. But we're hoping that down the line, these boats will become more efficient and we'll start to see boats taking on less and less power, but who knows? Um, most of the modern super yacht, as was mentioned before, have converters on the boat that are able to transfer from the 50 hertz to 60 and vice versa. So you'll see less converters on the docks. Um, easy connections, talking about cam locks. In this lower photo, you'll see the cam locks on the left side. This is really a convenience factor for the larger vessels. It allows um, the vessel to hardwire to their own or to the a, plugs that were given by the marina and they don't have to hardwire into the pedestal or you don't have to call in another company to hardwire the vessel. The other thing that Nicole also touched upon is space considerations when you're planning out super yacht shore power. Um, like she said, you just can't have these huge pedestals right next to the side because vessels will hit them and or people need to pass by them. Also taking in consideration marina substations because they do take up a lot of room. These super yacht pedestals are very large. The next for utilities, fuel, pump outs, water, and fire. For most marinas, I'm not gonna say all, but most marinas, you can't ask a 90 meter boat to go to the fuel dock to take on fuel. So you really just have to determine what's the most efficient way to put fuel onto the vessel, whether it's truck to boat, whether it's in-slip fueling with extension lines and or pump trucks. Sometimes pumps and tanks, the standard way, is not the most efficient because these vessels are taking on fuel anywhere from 80 to 150 gallons per minute. And just to put that in perspective, for your car, you normally pump around 10 to 15 gallons per minute. So these vessels are taking on fuel very quickly. Um, then sewage pump out. Again, most of these mega yachts will have pumps that pump sewage off the vessel. So we're finding that our pumps on the docks run slower than the pumps on the vessel. So having a straight sewer line that the vessels can pump directly into is more efficient and you don't have to worry about blowing out lines in or maintenance of these pumps. So it's the maintenance for the pump out and the maintenance for the fuel pumps. Allowing the truck to boat to happen is a lot more efficient and the same without getting rid of the pumps. Potable water, of course, you have to take into consideration these vessels are taking on a lot of water, so having larger hose bibs is important. Also, for the mid range boats, you may have water softeners, and that just goes back to keeping docks clear and clean, just knowing that the vessels will come with more items. That's also um, flush mounting connections on docks are popular right now. And they also are very important because you don't have to worry about golf carts ripping off connections and or people ripping off connections. When it's flush mounted, you don't even have to think about that. Amenities. Levels of service that are equivalent to five-star resorts. And this is pretty much for all marinas. 
people want to be taken care of. So that's with things like concierge services, dependable shore power and Wi-Fi, true space versus owner space. So do you have a facility that needs a separation of crew space versus owner space? Do your owners want to hang out with the crew in the places like the lounge, in the gym, in the outdoor recreation areas like tennis courts, restrooms, and pools? Or do you have to create two separate areas for that? Convenience, um, access to restaurants, entertainment, shopping, and as Nicole said, for things like deliveries and trash, having really easy access to these items. Also, nearby parking is huge for these super yachts. Um, being able to pull up to the boat, either unload owners, unload items, just having parking as close as possible, and or golf carts to help transport is very important. And also just taking into consideration if you may need a ship store or a small one on property. Just really keeping owners and crew in mind when designing these facilities. Another thing with super yacht facilities, um, they're often used to host events. So this takes on a whole new type of planning. Um, you'll really have to think about temporary docks and or gangways that you may have to connect to your already existing docks. You'll also have to really plan for additional people and equipment during setup and events and entertainment space. You'll have to think about things like, do I need to make sure that my dock can support a forklift on the dock? And as well as, can the utility lids support that same forklift? And then, of course, all the support facilities, so space for tents, space for extra restrooms, and or vendor showing. And a good example of that is the boat shows. Um, the boats are just loaded in every which way. And then on top of it, you have to add different vendors and space for guests. So super yacht operations. When you're designing these super yacht facilities, it's really important for a collaborative effort to happen with the owners and or operators of the facility with the designer. Owners and operators normally know their facility the best. They know the customers um, and what the customer can do. So understanding the needs of your facility based on location and restriction, this goes back to the home port facility and the destination facility. In super yacht facilities, the boats have professional crews running the vessel versus owner operator facilities. So with super yacht facilities, it may allow you to make slight adjustments on design just due to the fact that they have professional crews manning these vessels. Paying attention to details, decide what makes your facility unique, but I'll get more into that on the next slide. Keeping docks clutter um, free for these super yacht facilities, minimizing deck features for a clean modern look, then you'll have less conflicts with gangways and passerelle and people. And then I know we keep saying it, but designing with flexibility in mind the economic drivers, what does your facility have to offer in a downturn? We're in the super yacht facility, you're working with the 1%, and if there's an economic downturn, how do you make sure the vessels choose you as their home port? How do you make sure they stay with you throughout that downturn? So then general operations, general operations for all marinas, whether it's super yachts, home port destination, or everyday boater facilities, convenience is key. Um, you make, how do you make your facility stand out based on its location? Really focusing in on those details, focusing in on what your, makes your property unique. So that may be a brand. The brand may be your driver. Your brand and your brand features may be the thing that makes you guys stand out. And maybe something like feeding animals. Everyone knows about the pigs in the Bahamas. So is that something that drives your um, location and drives your facility? Feeding tarpon. Um, are you a fishing marina? Do, do people go there because they want to see people filleting fish? How do you embrace what makes you, you? Also, the environment should be a priority. It's 
there's always talk about rising waters and how we adjust when um, creating new marinas and also pollution. How can you be aware and make your customer aware of what we're doing? So easy access to recycling, um, bottled water, fountains, suitable shore power, and then last but not least, community. How is your facility supporting the local economy that supports you? How does your marina get involved with your community? And I think that's just a really important thing because in Fort Lauderdale, we're very, very um, happy to work with all of our local vendors and we have a very unique location, but just supporting them and supporting your community is very important. And then I think I will turn it over to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Appreciate it. And actually, I thank uh, the, the, the three uh, other presenters as well um, for uh, doing a good overview of uh, the two working group manuals. So at this point, we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, just uh, and Rachel probably unmute everyone uh, at that point, uh, and then I think uh, any other questions we may have in um, in, in the chat uh, will also be uh, addressed. Just uh, if you're presenting a question, um, we kind of group them again by topic and um, by presenter. So if there's one, you know, area you want to express and you have, uh, you know, one of the presenters was specific to it, uh, please, uh, please go to that. Okay. Hi, all. Um, so actually, Brian, what I would say is I would continue to have everyone muted. Um, what we're going to do is if you need to unmute your line, just hit star six. You can also type in a question to the chat. Um, uh, if you wish to, if you don't want to speak, you can type one into the chat. Um, again, it's star six if you want to unmute yourself individually, but make sure your phone is also unmuted. Um, so we'll take a few moments, moments for questions. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for people to speak up, um, I am going to actually share how you can access these documents. So let me just take over as presenter for a moment here. Um, let me share uh, the screen. Um, so uh, hopefully you can now see my screen. And uh, what I'd like to show you is that uh, you can access the webinars I mean, sorry, you can access the, the reports referenced by going to org. So that's piank.org. Uh, and you can uh, actually click on Publications. And that will show you a list of latest publications. But if you want to go specifically to the Recreational Navigation Commission ones, you could click RecCom at the bottom. And then you can purchase or some reports are actually available for free. They can be purchased individually, but what I would recommend is to join your PIANC national section and then you would have access to all PIANC reports. Over 100 years of, of reports are available for free to members. Uh, so for joining PIANC USA, you do that at PIANC.us and you can just click membership and then join PIANC USA for all the information on how to join. And uh, again, I'll just remind everybody, uh, if you want to uh, view the future webinar or share it with your friends that might have missed it, friends and colleagues that missed it, um, just simply subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the notification button, and it will notify you when we have new videos up. You can already view the most recent webinar from our Environmental Commission, and this webinar posting will be up soon. And we'll send out an email to all the registered participants. 
uh, when it, it is available for you to, to view as well. And one last thing for registered participants, if you wish to receive um, PDHs or CEUs, uh, we can provide a certificate for uh, registered attendees to this uh, webinar. Uh, so, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So uh, if you would like to receive a certificate uh, with a for, for a one hour PDH or CEU, please send an email to uh, pink at usace.army.mil, and I'll I'll put that post that email in the chat as well. If you shoot us an email between now and um, uh, close of business March 13th, we'll be able to to get a certificate emailed back to you. Um, it w we'll have to verify you were a registered attendee and that you attended, but we will get that out to you. And so uh, I'm going to just see if there's any questions in the chat here. Uh, so we had some, a comment from Fabio that says, uh, it is also recommended to think about that maintenance cost in the future operation of the marina and select the best method. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, and he also added low operational cost has to be a drive driven factor in the design phase. So I don't know if there was any other comments or questions. Again, you can hit star six to unmute. Uh, so we had a question on, uh, will we be sharing the slides? Um, again, we will definitely have a recording of the, the webinar available. Uh, would the speakers be okay with us posting the slides up on the, the pink.us website so that people can download them? Sure. Okay, yeah. Yes. So, so we'll provide a link then when we, we share out the uh, recording link. We'll, we'll share the slides as well to all the registered participants. Uh, at least through our website, you can download them from there. Or maybe we'll just email them. I'll, we'll decide what, what, what works best. I think it's a large file size. It's a large file, right? I think we, yeah, we'll, we'll end up just uh, giving the link for download. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we'll give a link to download it. That's what we'll do. Any other questions? For the uh, the presenters regarding the presentations, or just about Pianc in general. All right. Well, we're a little past two thirty, so mm -hmm. uh, I, if anybody does have folks for the the pres uh, questions for the presenters, uh, we oh wait we got a new question here. Um, is there any common figure for agitation for super yachts for 100 year event? Common figure. I'm 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 not quite sure what that means. Are common configuration? Uh, or I'm sorry. Or are we looking at for an agitation threshold for super yachts? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. There is you some know, guidance I, the pipeline. There you go. I yeah. think there is some guidance within the PINK uh, present um, um, publication. Is there not? Yes, there, there is. is. Yeah. The the criteria is a little bit more relaxed for super yachts than it is for small crafts. It may not be given for the hundred year event, though. It might just be up to the fifty. Oh, and so that person just sent in a correction. They said, I mean, wave height limit. Yeah, it's not tied directly to the 100 year, but there's some general criteria of what um, super yachts can, can support, whereas small craft facilities, you generally try to keep the basin under one foot. You can expand a little bit further on that.
All right. Well, uh, if we don't have any further questions coming in through the chat, oh wait, whoop, just another one comes in. Um, so someone just said, I've noticed that recommended turning basin diameter for super yachts is 1.3 LOA, but for smaller yachts it's 1.5 LOA. Is this due to considerations for better maneuverability of super yachts, i.e., uh, bow thruster slash professional crew? Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> I can lay with that. Yeah. Go ahead, Margaret. Oh, I was going to say that with um, with super yachts and larger vessels, they tend to have uh, better maneuverability due to bow thrusters or reverse screwed um, propellers. So they they can actually spin almost uh, directly around without any uh, additional need for for lengthening that turning circle. Um, but as you get down into the smaller boats, they don't have those eight, uh, and in which case they have to rely more just on the stern side propeller to move them around and therefore need larger turning radiuses. All right, thanks, thanks again for that question. And uh, any other questions? Uh, Feel free to type in the, the chat. We'll probably leave it over another minute or two. And you can also hit star six if you wish to unmute your line individually and ask a question directly. And I would also say if, uh, there are our email addresses um, at the beginning and end of the presentation. If there's anyone who just wants to reach out directly, um, that's perfectly acceptable by any of us. Yes. Yeah, so and we and we can send those out too in our follow up email. So if you think of a question later on, um and if you have a, a general P Ink question, um that that email that I just posted in the chat, P Ink at USACE dot army dot mil, we will be able to respond with any P Ink questions regarding membership or access accessing the reports uh, if you wish to make sure you get access once you've joined PINK, for example, we'd be happy to help you out. I'm sure as I start wrapping it up again, I'll get another question. <laughs> but uh, but uh, if uh, we don't see any more in the chat, I will uh, close out our our second webinar in our technical webinar series. Stay tuned. If you're not receiving our emails, uh, go to pink.us and uh, hit the contact us to to ask to be added to our email list or just simply email pink at usace.army.mil and we can add you to our email list or you can also follow us on social media. So in addition to YouTube, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and Instagram. So feel free to stay in touch that way if that's your preference and hear about the, the next upcoming webinars, we are going to be scheduling an Inland Navigation Commission webinar very soon, as well as a Maritime Commission webinar uh, coming up in the spring and the summer, and possibly some others throughout the year as well. So stay tuned and subscribe uh, to uh, or follow us on social media so that you can hear the latest new uh, ones are coming out and uh, when, when new reports and other publications and other announcements come out. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to especially thank our speakers uh, and presenters and all of our participants. Thank you so much for, for logging in and joining our PNQ USA webinar. Thanks, all. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.